Welcome to Run Long Run Healthy, where each week my co-host Brady Homer and I usually distill the latest in run science and research into practical strategies that hopefully we can all find ways to apply to our own running. So today I'm actually doing a solo episode to look at this pretty interesting new paper that came out that looks at the training habits and resultant finishing times of Boston Marathon runners. What's particularly interesting about this paper, which just came out two or three weeks ago and was published in Sports Medicine, is that it considers the full 12 months of training leading up to Boston Marathon, and it looks at patterns within those 12 months, which it splits into two buckets, as I'll get into, and how different training approaches during these different two buckets of time impacted the, the survey respondents final marathon time. Now this paper was put together by a pretty big team of Boston Marathon sports medicine experts who have been steadily releasing um, new data and new research on marathon running. I can link to some of it below. And what I particularly like about this study is because it looks at training practices, it has got some pretty universal takeaways that almost anyone considering running any marathon, whether it's Boston or otherwise, can apply. And it complements another study we looked at almost, that came out almost a year ago very well. So that study I'm talking about came from the University of Hertfordshire. It was a much bigger study. It looked at 151,000 runners and their marathon performance. But that study only considered the four months leading up to the marathon, which would be typically considered your, your normal traditional marathon training block. So that study, I'll link to it below as well. I'll also link to a video we put out a few months ago that broke down that study. The conclusions were essentially that volume of low intensity runs was the biggest uh, lever that a runner could use in those 16 weeks leading up to the marathon to improve their marathon time. And that a pyramidal approach to training, which is to say the bulk of your training done at low intensity, a moderate amount at medium intensity, and a small amount with high intensity was the most successful training strategy. So what's particularly nice about this new study is that instead of just looking at those four months, the classic marathon prep block, it considers the full 12 months leading up to the marathon. What's interesting is that it looks at the four month block and it looks at the eight month block distinctly. It considers the mesocycle as they call it of the race specific preparation block those four months before the race and the conclusions from this study are actually pretty similar to the other study in terms of more volume is the most important lever you can pull but what's really interesting in this new study is their findings related to the eight months leading up to the four month marathon specific block so these eight months they considered them they called them the habitual running phase or the base building phase the macro cycle in which you aren't specifically training for your goal marathon necessarily, but you're doing some form of base training. And the reason these researchers put together this study is that they had a hypothesis that those eight months were more important to your marathon finish time than the four months leading up to it. And it looks like they were right. So let me run you through the methodology of this new study. It was a survey carried out they sent it through the Boston Athletics Association to everybody who was running the 2022 Boston Marathon and asked them to share their training data for the 12 months leading up to the marathon. Now, of the 24, almost 25,000 runners from that year, 917 had replied with all their data. So it's only about 4% of the field. The average respondent had nine years of marathon training under their belt and had completed around 16 marathons. So these are pretty veteran marathon runners, pretty accomplished marathon runners. Their average Boston marathon finishing time was 3.45, slower than what some people might consider a, Boston, a typical Boston marathon time, but it's faster than an average marathon time. Um, so 3.45 average, 3.53 for the women and 3.35 for the men. That placed most of these runners in the trained developmental category according to the World Athletics grading criteria. The survey gathered information on weekly mileage, number of runs per week, quality sessions as they define them, which is basically any form of speed training like intervals, tempo runs, fartleks, and cross training. A couple of limitations to bear in mind that that Brady picked up on. So Brady actually covered this study in a recent newsletter. Uh, it was a survey-based study. So the data depended on the runner's recall, I guess maybe when they didn't have full Strava data. And also the study didn't tease apart um, 
any details of cross training. They just put all forms of non-running training into one bucket and called it cross training. So strength training, cycling, etc., all went into the same bucket. I think it's worth noting here that the typical respondent wasn't somebody that was either a beginner marathon runner or coming back to marathon running after a long layoff. Most of these runners, the typical profile was an active runner who in that eight month base phase was putting in the work because that's relevant to the results here. Okay, so what did they discover? Well, in the macro cycle, those eight months from 12 months to four months before the race, higher training exposure, more volume was consistently linked to faster times. Specifically, running over 10 hours per week predicted significantly better performance. Every additional run per week was worth about three or four minutes off marathon time, and each extra quality session or speed session per week shaved off 16 to 17 minutes on average. Adding just one kilometer per week in this macro cycle phase was associated with about 30 to 40 seconds faster times. Okay, and what didn't matter so much in the macro cycle in the habitual running phase? Cross training. It doesn't seem like the quantity or length of cross training sessions performed by the respondents in those eight months of base building had much effect on the final marathon time. Okay, now let's look at the mesocycle, which is the four months leading up to the marathon, which is typically when people are training specifically towards their marathon. Again, it was found that running over 10 hours per week, high volume, was associated with a faster finishing time. Each additional running session per week was worth about three minutes of additional marathon time. Each additional quality or speed session per week lowered marathon time by around 70 minutes. So, so far in terms of the impact on your marathon finishing time, the types of runs and the volume of runs between the mesocycle and the microcycle, they have fairly similar impacts on your final marathon training times. A couple of interesting notes is that cross training did actually help closer to race day. So it was found that athletes who incorporated cross training in those final four months ran significantly better. Each extra cross training session per week shaved about six minutes off marathon time. But here's the biggest finding from the paper. It was found that runners that reduced the actual number of runs they did per week in those final four months leading up to the marathon actually ran faster than those who kept those number of runs the same or increased the number of runs. Typically, those who reduced their number of runs per week shaved three minutes off their marathon time. Again, I think it's worth underlining that most of the respondents to this survey were serial marathon runners who were would have been doing decent mileage in that base building phase. If you're an occasional runner, it probably isn't a good idea to reduce your number of runs in the four months leading up to your marathon. But for people who have been running consistently at decent mileage for a few years, there's definitely strong evidence here that backing off in those last four months, at least in the number of runs, can have a positive impact on your marathon finish time. So I'd say we've got three big takeaways we can share from this paper for regular marathon runners, which actually I've taken from uh, Brady's work on this paper. Number one is that more overall mileage matters, whether it's in the 12 to four month window or the final four months before your race, the more mileage, the better. It leads to a better marathon time. And that's something we already knew. Everything, all the research has pointed to that. That was probably the main finding from that big study I mentioned at the start. Takeaway number two is don't forget to include variety in your weekly plan. The authors do underline the importance of quality sessions, as they call it, speech ses speed training of one type or another. And it's worth noting here that cross training definitely did add some value in those last four months. They just unfortunately didn't specify what type of cross training. And number three is don't fear cutting back, especially those runners who are just used to running high mileage weeks anyway. Uh, actually, a modest reduction in run frequency in that final training phase is linked to better performance. It's the classic taper. So a couple of things I personally like about this paper is one, it encourages runners like me actually, to perhaps think about marathon training and planning with a 12 month lens as opposed to say a four to six month lens, which I, which I would argue is more typical. I'm not somebody who, for the last couple of years, I haven't been a runner who's had that consistent weekly base mileage. It's been much more inconsistent. So as I start to think about future target marathon races, I'm much more aware of the value of that base and how I need to think about it over a 12 month period and not just the classic four month marathon build period. And the other thought that I often have when I'm looking at this type of study is about survivorship bias, which is to say all the data we have in this study, just like the other study, 
comes from runners who successfully trained for and then completed their marathon. And as everybody watching this probably knows, every marathon there's a not insignificant percentage of runners who get injured when training, so don't end up getting to the start line. So what's contained in these studies is the patterns and strategies of those runners who manage to avoid injury and successfully complete a marathon. I'm always interested in not just what we should do, but what we should avoid doing. I think if there was a way to get that data of runners who had signed up for a marathon and started training, but dropped out due to injury or burnout or whatever, and looked at the habits that they had in common, I think that would be a pretty compelling study. And, and this is conjecture here, but I imagine the respondents of this study that had a solid base from the eight months base building phase were much less likely to get injured in those four months leading up to marathon. But perhaps that's a thought for another time. Anyway, if you've made it this far, thanks for watching. Any questions you've got or any comments, I always appreciate them. And as always, till next time.